since the release of your memories, uh, another good friend of yours published his autobiography, Keith Richards. Uh, I met Robert Plant last year and he told me that he was surprised that Keith could remember anything. Uh, w w did you read it and uh, were you surprised too? No, I wasn't surprised at all. I mean, it, that's an illusion that everybody was so fucked up they can't remember anything. I, l I read it, I really liked it, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, is there something uh, you'd like to rectify? Me? No. I, I, j I have no comment about it. <laughs> no. Because he's such an honest guy. Well, um, you know, it's his own view. Right. It's his personal vision. Mm. And I don't agree with everything he said, but it's his right to have his own say, you know. So, no, I'm not going to comment on, mm. on Keith's book, no. I liked it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that um, he also liked your memories, and, and uh, you, you wrote that also in the uh, second part, uh, the second book. I think you mentioned that. Yes, that, uh, he loved it. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. He was the complete star of my book. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mick didn't like it. Um, what's your reaction? I guess he didn't like Keith's book uh, neither. So, uh, uh, well, that's do understandable. <laughs> Um, I don't really talk about the Rolling Stones anymore. Right, I'm right. really pleased and grateful and proud to have been part of the that generation, part of the 60s generation. Very, I learned an awful lot from the Stones. I'm so grateful for As Tears Go By. It was a wonderful thing to write Sister Morphine with Mick Jagger. But on a personal level, you know, my friendship with Keith is really private. And I don't answer questions mm -hmm. about the stones anymore. Mm -hmm. You've already got more than anybody, so <laughs> it's kind of over now. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, it's astounding, it's very moving to how um, dark the years were in the 70s. Um, what do you think What was there? Like a, a moment when you realized um, this summer of love isn't just not happening the way we want it? What, what was it for you? No, I mean, listen, the 70s were fantastic for a lot of people. You can't say that. I may have had a hard time in the 70s, and I, I did, but it picked up, you know, I made broken English and things got better. Um, No, I, I, I never believed in the summer of love. The summer of love was a media invention, like Carnaby Street. It's all made up, you know? I think there was an obvious um, crash for some of us after the 60s, yes, because what goes up so high will have to fall. I know that. Um, And for some people, it was it was the end. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, you allow me one question about the the Beatles, or oh, yeah. yeah, okay, great, great. <laughs> the stones, I think. Okay, well, I understand that yeah. completely. Yeah, one section in your book, I loved it, um, and. Uh, You, you were so close and uh, you described this moment when you, I think, heard for the first time, was it Hey Jude? Yeah. Yes. Could you just tell us um, in a short version how that happened? Because it's so fascinating. Well, I, I, I don't know if I could do it any better than I did it in the book. That's true. <laughs> uh, that's where you really get the, the right version. I, it was in the mid-60s, I think. Yeah. Um, and the cocaine dealer of the Stones opened a club called the Vesuvio Club and it was actually only open for one night that <laughs> night and it was just a room in Tottenham Court Road actually in a basement with a lot of cushions and a great sound system so we were all sort of lying around like wonderful decadent 60s people like you do you know um, on various substances, N on my case nothing too hard, you know, and playing music and, and enjoying ourselves. And then Paul came in, Paul, Paul McCartney, looking like he'd laid an egg, you know, 
which of course he had, and uh, he quietly went up to Tony, the coat dealer, and said he had a, an acetate, could he put it on? And it was Hey Jude. And it just blew everything away. And Paul and the Stones and the Beach Boys and everybody, they were all very competitive, you know. Brian Wilson would would f get hold of the new Beatles record and Paul would get hold of the new Brian Wilson record. They had to know what... They had to compete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But really, when you're talking about the Beatles, nobody there's nobody who can compete. Yeah. There's, you can't even imagine what it's like to be a Beatle. And I love Paul, and I see him quite a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. But he is a Beatle, and that's that. Um, now talking about the seven deadly sins, um, uh, there's Anna one, there's Anna two. Yeah. Um, is Marian faithful uh, like the result of those two personas? No, Marian faithful is those two personas. <laughs> okay, I see. For the duration of the show, I mean, not always. Right. No. Right. Right. No. 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 I have to be both. Right. But uh, I guess you uh, you have to have this life experience like you had them um, to live this persona on stage. No? You get That's little young little sopranos singing this part with absolutely no life experience. You know, if I hadn't if I had become a classical singer, which I could have done, mm. I could have been singing this this role of Anna at 22. You know, you no, of course you don't. That's what you. That's what's unique about my performance. That's all, mm -hmm. is that people get this frisson of oh, she must know the seven deadly sins so well. You know, um, and I do because I'm I'm an I'm an aware, conscious human being. I mean, if you're if you're not aware of it, the seven deadly sins, you're dead. I think. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> Which is uh, of all these sins, which one is, uh, no, is the no? You're uh, not. You're yeah, yeah, go yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, of all the seven deadly sins, which one is your favourite? Oh no, no, not at all. Which one is the hardest to resist? There are there are quite a few. It's impossible to resist. Yeah, really. And then you know you, you congratulate yourself, or I used to congratulate myself and say that well, I haven't suffered much from envy. You know, but I'm sure I have. I'm sure there's nothing to be proud of in my moral character. I mean, I know I, I have pride is my main one. You know. Sloth, gluttony, anger. I'm not too angry anymore. Actually, I'm not angry, but I used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not bothered with lust anymore, but I used to be. Mm -hmm. Um. It's interesting, yeah. Why aren't you that angry anymore? Uh, is I don't know. It's just part of getting older and, and, and really understanding my life. You mm -hmm. know, I don't have to get angry anymore. Mm -hmm. I was angry it, when I was a sort of inarticulate, flailing, angry little person, saying, "Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening?" And I honestly didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I thought everyone was out to get me and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know now, so I don't. Mm -hmm. I know that I, I. I know the situation. I see it very clearly. I'm not angry anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, w something that touched me also very much was um, how you described that it was a painter who helped you out when you were uh, walking uh, on the streets of London. A very skinny girl. Great. A very, a very fantastic painter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was Which a friend of mine, I'm not a very good friend, mm -hmm. but and he was a really nice guy, you mm -hmm. know. And um, he he noticed, he noticed me, mm -hmm. and he he couldn't do much about it, you know. He never questioned. Francis never questioned people's lifestyle choices, you know, mm -hmm. really. But he did what he could to help. Mm -hmm. And in my case. I, I was also anorexic, apart from living on the street and taking heroin, mm -hmm. I was anorexic. Mm -hmm. So he would give me lunch now and again, mm -hmm. which I thought was really nice of him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, uh, do you have a painting of Francis Bacon? Yeah. Unfortunately not. <laughs> um, now, um, I wondered, 
what brought you to Brecht and Weil? I think, um, <coughs> was it um, your grandmother who introduced you to no. this? No. No, my parents. Your parents, mm -hmm. right, yeah. Particularly my mother. Mm -hmm. Somehow they managed to bring her record collection to England. Not The Seven Deadly Sins. I never heard that until Hal Wilner played it to me. It must have got broken. Okay. I think. Mm -hmm. Or it would be in there. Mm -hmm. But all the rest of it, the Dry Groschen Oper and Mahagoni and everything, mm -hmm. I heard it as a child. I mean, I didn't consciously put it on the record player myself. No. Mm -hmm. But I, it was in the background. Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, am I right, Austrian ancestors? Yeah, Austro-Hungarian. Yeah, Austro-Hungarian. Yeah. Yeah, Austro um, uh, you're singing in English right now, but... Uh, I couldn't uh, sing in German. Have you considered it once? I have considered yeah. it. Um, Anita Palenberg, mm -hmm. my great friend, would really like me mm -hmm. to sing it in German. But I just haven't got the German, you know. Mm -hmm. I spoke good German for a child, I suppose, when I was about three. And when I came back from Vienna, my mother tried to continue me speaking German, and I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be different from other children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm not going to put myself under that much stress. I don't know if you can imagine how hard this is for me. Well, I can't because I'm not um, a singer, so, uh, but uh, I guess... Well, it's you know, it's, it's is right it out of... Mm -hmm. I'm a, like a fish out of water, really. Mm -hmm. This is an extremely concentrated and complicated part, and, uh, and I have a very limited voice. Mm -hmm. To add on a foreign language mm -hmm. would be too much, no. Mm -hmm. I'd um, have a heart attack, I think. <laughs> 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 One of our viewers wanted to know, how do you treat your voice? Because uh, this is so difficult to sing. And, uh, I, unfortunately, I really don't do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. The only thing I do for my voice is I steam it and um, I, I get a lot of sleep mm -hmm. and I don't drink. Uh, is there a ritual just before you go on stage? No. no. Like what? I don't know. Nor do I. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who believe in tea, for instance, hot oh, tea. Well, yeah, I didn't know that was a ritual. Well, I thought that's normal. Can be. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I see ginger that. and lemon. Fresh ginger, lemon and honey. Okay. And I use that in my rock and roll work too, all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. A last question. I guess you knew that uh, I think it was in this hotel where Theodor Herzl um, <coughs> created the idea of a, a how do you say, Zionistic? What? Zionistic Zionist. country? Zionist country? The Zion. Zion. Yeah. Zion. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is it? He that conceived uh, Zion in this hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and. Uh, I wondered, um, I read that you have like a Jewish... Uh, um, I had a Jewish grandmother. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you feel like there also a special connection to the work of Brecht and Weil? Yeah. I th mm. Well, it's particularly Kurt Weil. Brecht wasn't Jewish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Kurt Weil. And he's using a lot of his scales. He's using from the temple, ah, okay. actually, yeah. which make them rather difficult. Right. And I seem to have some kind of ability to do it, which is unusual. And I think it's genetic, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs>